and most of all to see how your word and your people in the Bible are just like us. As we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our scripture reading today is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. And behold, two of them were going that very day to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things which had taken place. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself approached and began traveling with them. But their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are these words that you are exchanging with one another as you are walking? And they stood still looking sad. One of them, named Cleopas, answered and said to him, Are you the only visitor, the only one visiting Jerusalem and unaware of the things which have happened here in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, The things about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word in the sight of God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, beside all this, it is the third day since these things happened. But some women among us amazed us. When they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it exactly as the women had all, also had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O oh, foolish men and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary for Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them, all the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. As they approached the village where they were going, he acted as though he were going farther. But they urged him, saying, Stay with us, for it is getting toward evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he had reclined at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it, and breaking it, he began giving it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. They said to one another, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking with us on the road, while he was explaining the scriptures to us? And they got up at that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found gathered together the eleven and those who were with them saying, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then they began to relate their experience on the road and how he was recognized by them in the breaking of the bread. <clears throat> well, I'm sure you've all been on, on a journey to different places and they take different forms. Well, there was a... a Orienteer, which is a British form of a person out hiking with a compass. And of course, nowadays it's much easier. You have a GPS and you, you put your starting point in where, you, where your camp is and then you go off and wander and look at things and then you point it back and your GPS brings you right back to your camp where you started. But in the old days before GPS, you used a, a compass to find your way. And this orienteer was out walking when he came to a narrow part of the River Severn in England. 
And he looked over and he saw another orient pier on the opposite bank. And so he yelled over to him. He said, hey, how do I get over to the other side? And the other orienteer looked. He looked down to the, the right. And, and then he looked down to the left. And he thought a bit. And then he called back. And he said, you are on the other side. <laughs> it's all a matter of perspective. Well, in this story of the two travelers to a man, they thought they had, they had turned the corner, that they, they were on the other side, and things would not be the same after having a period of great hope and expectations. And now, third day, they're saying, they're on the other side. There, there's no hope. There's no more expectations. And they were heading home. And you know, after a sad event, a common reaction with many people is we, we just want to get away. We want everything to be done and over with. We want to get things behind us. You know, we, we certainly want different or better circumstances. But we often have no control over our circumstances. We can only choose how we respond to our circumstances. And so in verse 13, we have these two travelers, and on the same Sunday that Jesus was raised, they were going to a little village called Emmaus. And what we have in Luke is the first of three resurrection appearances, and it's unique to Luke. So we have Jesus first on the road to Emmaus, he also appears to the 11 apostles, and he has a specific, special appearance to Peter. Why? Because after the denial, after everything that had gone down, Peter failed. But Peter was still the de facto leader. And he knew, he felt, that he failed. He denied Jesus that he knew him. The powerlessness to do anything or say anything during the trial and everything going up on before the, the crucifixion. <laughs> he had failed and he knew it. And so Jesus, so Jesus gives Peter a special cup. And there's four parts to today's message. We have the disciples, and they're walking to Emmaus. We have the conversation with, with Cleopas. We have the, the women's report. We have the other women's report going to the, the room where the, the other disciples were. We have the report of the angelic visit to the women. And then we have the stranger, which is Jesus explaining the scripture, the reason for the Messiah's death and resurrection. And then the two disciples invite the stranger to dinner, and in breaking the bread, the meal opens their eyes. And then the two disciples return to Jerusalem where they learn that the Lord has appeared to Peter, and then they share the experience that they had on the road. <clears throat> So this passage starts off telling us two things. 
On the same day, the same Sunday, the resurrection Sunday, there's two disciples going to Emmaus. And in verse 14, it says, they were discussing everything that had taken place. I mean, what else do you do while you're walking along the road but discuss what has been going on? And they didn't quite understand it. You know, it's been said that the apostles attended the best seminary in the world, sitting for three years at the feet of Jesus, being taught by him. Well, it's been said these two disciples attended the best one-day lecture, and it's available to us in verses 20 through 24. But the Bible also tells us that they were discussing and they were arguing. And nothing's changed on that point of religion. Just, just get two people together, start <clears throat> discussing religion, and you're going to get an argument going pretty quick. And so verse 16 tells us that literally their eyes were kept from being opened or seeing who the stranger was that joined them. In those days, it was common for people to, to join up as they traveled. Number one, to protect each other from, from robbers that would, would roam the, the countryside. But also, that was how people got the news. They didn't, they didn't pull out the newspaper and get the newspaper and... Uh, you know, even, even around the, the turn of the 19th cent, century, they'd have the, the Robertsville column and the Paris column, and you'd buy the newspaper and you'd open it up and it'd say, oh, so-and-so was visiting so-and-so, and, and this person's sick. And that's how you got your news. Today, you look at the internet, but back then there was none of that. So what they did is... Uh, Somebody from, from Galilee and Jerusalem going to like a village from Emmaus would join up and they'd say, hey, what's, what's going on in, in Galilee these days? And they'd tell them, and, or what's going on in, in Jerusalem? So when Jesus joined them, this stranger, so they thought, it was a way of keeping up with the news. In the, in the 70s, people would hitchhike and, and share news and see different places until people started getting killed from it, and then they stopped doing it. So God keeps them from recognizing Jesus, and he asks them, what are these words that you are exchanging? Essentially, what are you guys arguing about? So I guess they were pretty pretty loud and pretty animated when they were doing it. And in verse 18, it says that Cleopas, which is the Hebrew Aramaic version of the name, the Greek is Cleopatros, and they ask him, are you... Or are you visiting alone? Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know these things that have happened there in these days? Jesus wants to continue the discussion and ask them what, what things. And the answer is Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet, powerful in action and speech before God and all the people. Of course, they tell about the crucifixion, and he was dead and buried. And see, in this verse, in these verses, there are three lessons for us to follow or adopt in our lives. The first, it says Jesus was approved 
before God. <coughs> well, why? Because he was a prophet. Say, well, we may not be prophets, but we can be prophetic in the lives of others by using the word of God. But if we do so, if we are going to be prophetic using the word of God, we need to do it in a way that keeps us approved before God. And the word of God is prophetic. And it has commands in it, things that we should be using. We should be doing. But unfortunately, too often, especially these days, the Word of God is used to, to injure and, and bludgeon and bully and hurt homosexuals and divorced people and, and other Christians. You know, on certain issues, we have absolutely no grace and no mercy. But thankfully, God does. See, if we're going to use the Bible, we need to use it in context. And we need to use it in context of the passages. Or it really has no meaning for our lives and therefore no use. See, God wants us either hot or cold. The, the lukewarm church or people, it tells us in Revelation, God spits out of his mouth. Now there's a price to be paid for taking a stand, but most people don't want to make it. They don't want to pay the price. You know, unfortunately, we, we, the Bible tells us that there will be a day when we call wrong right and right wrong. And I think we've arrived at those days and we're moving into a more and more. But we're afraid to call things right or wrong according to God's word. <clears throat> We, we let things happen by default. If you don't believe me, just, just look at, at Congress. They have a bunch of laws that they should be following, but they don't. Look at some of the churches and the denominations and the stands they take or won't take. And so here's these disciples, and they're walking along. They've lost hope. And I mean, I know some of you have, have been there, and they're just planning on moving on. They said Jesus was the one to redeem Israel. But they're discouraged. It's been three days. And oftentimes we want to move on when something bad happens. We want to forget those things that have happened. Just turn away and, and, and go someplace else. But hear this. What if God has other plans? What if you just wanted something bad happens, you want to move on, forget about it? What if God has other plans for you? What if God is planning something that will surprise us and change how things will look? No matter the circumstances, there is always an element of what, of what is happening to us or what has happened to us that we cannot and do not understand. See, in verse 24, it tells us that they were astonished when the women reported that they had seen a vision of angels 
who told them Jesus was alive. And think about it. The women are confused by what they've seen. They told the disciples they don't understand. Peter, John, and the other apostles are hiding. And these two are leaving town. They're moving on. And I'm sure that you've been there. I'm sure that you've been confused about things or not understanding things or, or saddened or disappointed. I mean, we've all been there at one time or another. And if that's what you're, you're feeling this morning or if that's something that you felt in your life in the past, then God has other plans for you. <clears throat> and here is the good news. No matter what you're feeling this morning, no matter what you're feeling today, no matter what you may feel in the future, no matter what you felt in the past, verse 25 gives us a way forward. We don't have to be stuck in the past. And Jesus says in verse 25, how unwise and slow you are to believe in your hearts. All the prophets have spoken. The answer is here for us. Everything that we need to know, everything that we need to hear is for us in the Word of God. In verse 26, there's another question. And then Jesus begins the greatest one-day lecture in verse 27. They seem to have learned much, and then at that time, they're ready to stop, and Jesus is ready to continue going. But there's two lessons here for us. The first one is, is Jesus comes at just the right time we need him in our lives. And the second lesson is that he stays with us, ministering to us as long as we need him. So Jesus stays and they have a meal very much like our Lord's Supper. And in verse 31, it tells us their eyes were open. And we have this verse, verse 31, their eyes were open, but we also have the following verses from the Bible. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 17. Then Elijah prayed, Lord, please open his eyes and let him see. So the Lord opened the servant's eyes. He looked and he saw that the mountain was covered with horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. And then in Luke chapter 24, back in verse 16, they were prevented from recognizing them. So God can open our eyes to see things that we might not normally see, and he can close our eyes so that we don't see things that we should see. Do you think there's some things that we miss that have a spiritual aspect in our lives? As we've seen from this verse and these verses, there's, there's a lot going around, going on around us. And we may miss it, we may not be aware, or we may fail to see it because our spiritual eyes are not working. Do you think there's some things that God prevents or keeps us from seeing? And again, the only possible answer is yes, by reading these verses. 
Yet even though we may not see with our eyes, God still reaches down into us. Look at what Paul writes in Acts and 1 Corinthians. Acts 17, verses 2 and 3. As usual, Paul went to the synagogue and on three Sabbath days or three weeks reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and showing that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 through 8, Paul says, For I passed on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, that he was also buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scripture, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to over 500 brothers at one time. Most of them are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one abnormally born, he also appeared to me. There's a great lesson here for us, along with the resurrection. You can go home again. Jesus knows that we will fail sometimes more than once. Jesus knew that Peter was going to fail right before the crucifixion. But he prays for us. He intercedes for us. The creator of the universe, the creator of you, prays for you and he prays for me. And he prayed for Peter. And he said, when he, Peter, turns back, strengthen your brothers. Yes, he is praying for us. He's in our corner urging us forward. Don't ever forget that. The lesson we can turn back to God after a mistake, and he will accept us. And because we know that Jesus is praying for us, it's possible that we may not realize it, we may not know it unless our spiritual eyes are open. But Jesus is walking and talking with us. The resurrection is a great event. And most people will agree with that if they believe it. But it has the most power and the most significance for us as believers. When the two started, the two disciples started out for Emmaus, they were focusing on their disappointment, their sadness. Their problems. And they missed and were missing the significance and the greatness of the resurrection. And too often we do the same thing. We lose sight of God and we look at our disappointments. We, we look at the problems we had before us. We, we focus on frustrated plans. And because of that, we miss the lessons that God has for us. We miss what God might be trying to teach us by looking and focusing on the wrong things. It's only when we lift up our eyes, when we look to Jesus, that we receive the power and the help that only he can bring into our lives. The second thing is the Bible, the Word of God, has answers for us in, our, in these troubled times. Even though we may be puzzled by the questions and the circumstances before us, the, the problems we face, the lack of understanding, the unknown why questions, there are answers there for us. 
Sometimes we may have to ask for God's under, wisdom to understand it. Sometimes we may need to ask for wisdom from other believers. But the answer always comes down to us applying God's word, applying God's grace and God's forgiveness to the circumstances that we might find in and then looking with spiritual eyes to the world that God has around us. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 146. Sooner or later, would you please stand? Number 146. <laughs>